Er hat neun Bestseller geschrieben und seine Bücher wurden weltweit mehr als 10 Millionen Mal verkauft, übersetzt in 43 Sprachen. Und wenn man allein das Jahr 2018 anschaut in Deutschland, dann war sein erstes Buch, das Café am Rande der Welt, das meistverkaufte Buch aus allen Kategorien. Und deswegen freue ich mich besonders, heute hier im Cosmic Cine TV Studio den Bestsellerautor John B. Strelecki begrüßen zu dürfen. Herzlich willkommen, John. Schön, dass du da bist. Thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation. So, we're talking about so many books now. You started with one and this was like kind of a life changer. I always ask myself, how did you get really to this point, being a manager or like a strategic um, person in a big company, all of a sudden realizing there's something wrong, I want to change things. So how did you get to that point? What was that spark that kind of kicked you out? Yeah, you know, I think so many times in life we have a dramatic experience and that causes us to step back and reflect on our life a little bit. And for me, one of the biggest ones was my grandfather passed away. And often when someone when when someone shares something like that, you think, oh, you must have been very close. And interestingly, it, it wasn't that I was very close. I had only met him about seven or eight times in my entire life. But I remember my mom calling me and I was in my apartment. I lived in uh, downtown Chicago in a high rise. And he had lived to be in his early 80s. And although I didn't know him well, I knew about his story. And for some reason on that night, after I got the call from my mom, I stepped back and thought to myself, if I live to be in my 80s, will I be okay with my life? And if I, I, if I continue on the trajectory I'm going on, and I make it to 80, will that be okay? And my answer was no. And so that was a very big wake up call to say, well, what needs to change in order to make it a yes? And uh, so, yeah, that it was, it was really that is sort of the defining moment. And I had prior to that been asking myself, isn't there more to life than this? It, it's not that my life was that bad. It's just, it just wasn't extraordinary. It wasn't great. It was just kind of fine, you know, and I was looking for something more than fine. So then you started to go on a worldwide trip for nine months and getting all of this, those experiences and really getting onto this road trip feeling. And it seems like you're still onto the road or on the road, um, <laughs> depending on, on where we catch you. Now you're in Orlando, Florida, and I'm here in, in Germany, in Leipzig. So um, what is that, that that made you go on the road, actually? You could have decided something else, right? Yeah, you know, from the time that I was a little kid, I, I had, was an adventurer at heart. And that's who I was. It's what I wanted to be. It's the kind of life that I wanted to live. And so when I had that defining moment, when my grandfather did pass away, I stepped back and said, well, what was the dream initially? And I have a bit of a convoluted story, which I won't go into all the details of, but my career track wasn't a very smooth and seamless one. Uh, I initially had wanted to be a pilot and I was on that trajectory for a long time and then found out I couldn't do it because of a medical condition. And all of it was tied to this dream of being an adventurer. And so there I was in my early 30s, stepping back and saying, what do I really want to do? And I decided, you know, from the time I was a little kid, what I wanted to do was be an adventurer. And so I did. I left everything behind, which when you're in your 30s, people hear that and they kind of get freaked out about that. <laughs> they think you've gone a little crazy, actually. But I did, I left everything behind, backpacked around the world for almost a year. And that was a transformative, life-changing experience. It was tapping into the essence of what I had hoped and thought life could be like. And it was from that experience that the first cafe book, Das Café Around the Welt, flowed through me over the course of 21 days. So had I have not followed my heart and been an adventurer, I, I would not be the author of the cafe books, that's for sure. So... Let's just have a little glimpse on the title because I always fi find it interesting to look on on the language. And as you yeah. said, you're an adventurer just by, you know, deciding to use language. You know, in former times you had to use this word or whatever. Today it's just words. It's kind of uh, funny and interesting, I think. Um, so in Germany, we call it the cafe on the edge of the world. And in English, we language, English as well. Yeah, it's the yeah, Why Cafe or the Why Are You Here Cafe. Is that correct? 
I know we call it the same title as you just said. It's the cafe on the edge of the world here as well. Oh, okay. Because I, uh, on in this book here, um, I kind of opened it and I looked what is the original title, and it said the Y Cafe. How come? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. So the the title in English has gone through a number of iterations over the years. Ah, mm -hmm. and uh, so yeah, that they're probably referencing the very very original copyrighted title. Um, but the the cafe on the edge of the world has a much more interesting sound to it. And so because the fans were responding so well to that, we took the opportunity to rename it and have it that in the uh, the United States as well. And that's really what it is primarily around the world. Every country gets to make their own decision. But for the most part, it's known as the cafe on the edge of the world around the world. And it kind of shows how people uh, what they are longing for or what where they are, their real deep um heart um, pleasure is maybe to kind of get out of everything, get out of that mm. uh, wheel of, you know, working, eating, going on vacation, but then coming back and all this. So it's kind of this turning wheel that you want to leave, which the title kind of picks up and puts you onto this new road. Um, so what do you think? Uh, why is that we always want to get away? Why can't we not just be friends with our everyday life? Well, I think it's possible to be friends with our everyday life if we love our everyday life. And that to me is the opportunity that we all have is to realize so much of it is our choice. And I think growing up, I didn't have that understanding. I find that most readers that I have the chance to interact with, the reason they connect so strongly with the story is that they also didn't have that understanding of life. It's uh, I think we're typically raised in the environment where it's just like, you know, you do good in school, And then you're going to get a job and then you're just going to work. And that's kind of the life experience. We live in a very, very precious time at this moment in the human story where we can define for ourselves what is fulfilling. What, what type of job could I do that Monday through Friday, I wouldn't just be trading hours for a paycheck, but I would actually be getting paid to do something that I find very meaningful and that feels in alignment with the purpose that I feel is mine on this planet. That's a very special opportunity for all of us now. And that's what people are craving, which is why they're drawn to the story. Okay, just have a little summary on, on like the basic line of the plot. There's this guy being a manager, being very discontent with his life and getting in a car, getting into a traffic jam and really kind of sneaking out of that traffic jam, being on some kind of roads and getting completely confused. He doesn't know where he is. He doesn't know where he's going. And the fuel is going down, 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 down. So he knows there's no way back. And where he's ending is this cafe somewhere in the, let's call it the desert or in the middle of nowhere. And there he's being welcomed by a very nice waitress. Her name is Casey. And she's, you know, saying hi and what do you want to eat? And then the conversation starts. And then he's kind of starting to reflect what his life has been so far and where, how he wants to go on. And the, the, the language, again, that you use is very, very simple. So, you know, did you consciously decide to use a very simple language or is it just how the story evolved? Can you give us an insight into that working secret that you might, might yeah, have? Yeah, sure. Well, there's, there's, uh, so I'll tell you the story behind the story. When I came back from backpacking around the world, I didn't know what I was going to do next. I, I, I saw the whole human experience through a different lens, through a different perspective. I had just spent almost a year in what I would call the nirvana state for me, being an adventure out there, seeing different places, experiencing different cultures, meeting people from different environments and, and, and countries. And it was exactly what I had dreamed of my whole life. And so when I came back from that experience, I didn't know what I was going to do next, but something inside of me said, sit down and start typing. And so I sat down and started typing. And over the course of 21 days, the story really flowed from somewhere else through me and onto the pages. And at the end of the 21 day, and I never thought, oh, what am I going to write tomorrow? And I never went back and read what I had already written. I literally would just sit down every day and let it flow. And at the end of the 21 days, I felt it was done and I printed it out and put it on a shelf. And when I sat and read it the very first time, what's in there is almost word for word what is in the book that readers read today. So it was a very unusual and special stream of conscious type experience where I was tapping into something much bigger than myself. And, you know, I'm, I like stories. When, when I was in school, I struggled to get through the nonfiction part of learning. 
But when they eventually would come to the one page in the textbook that was typically purple in our textbooks, and it was the story that explained the previous 10 pages, if it wasn't for those purple pages, I don't think I would have made it through school because it was the stories that explained the concept in a way that my brain could understand. And so I think part of the reason that the story flowed through me in the way that it did is because I was the first person who was supposed to read it and that was the right fit for me. Uh, but I do find that that type of language, um, short chapters, it works well. It, it's available and accessible to everyone. I can't tell you the number of people over the years who have said to me, I don't read books, but I read that one. And they're talking about the cafe on the edge of the world. And that is so heartwarming to me uh, because it means that it is accessible to all of us. I guess so. we now got to kind of like a little bit of the secrets of your success story is the universal questions that we're just going to talk about in a few minutes. And the let's call it the pure, simple language, which kind of gets to everybody, no matter what religion or political uh, thinking or which country he or she or it is from. Uh, we have it all, you know. <laughs> so yeah. let's... let's uh, and then you mentioned at the start, you know, you're talking about the different countries and it's actually now in 43 different languages and it's uh, over 10 million copies have sold. And so what that tells me, which I love as a world traveler, is that these questions that you're about to ask about are universal, that whether you're in Bulgaria or the United States or Germany or China, and you're growing up living your life, you're probably to some degree asking yourself this question, wait, why am I here? <laughs> How does this work? What is the point of this human experience? And I think that is beautiful because it connects us so much stronger than the divisiveness would seem on the outside. We're much more the same than we are different. And I think that's very inspiring for the whole human experience. So, yeah, we are all one as you, as you claim it for the first part. But on the other hand, I always sometimes felt reminded of the American dream, you know, there's everything is possible. You can, can get from the dishwasher to the millionaire. You just have to work hard. And if, when I watched a few interviews of you, I kind of thought, is that like, The American Dream Reloaded by John P. Stradecki. But there is a difference. Please tell me. Well, you know, what's interesting is certain cultures over time have a certain feel, a certain nuance to them, a certain essence. And then as the world is becoming much more global and we're having the opportunity to watch content from around the world, like here, I can't remember the name of the show, but there's an incredibly popular show from South Korea That is like everybody's talking, you know, that they're watching it. And how cool is that, right? And I noticed in Germany in particular, but certainly Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, although each of those countries has their own very unique culture, but Germany in particular, that there is a unbelievable enthusiasm for entrepreneurship and for carving out your own path and for choosing your own destiny. And so while that may have historically been something that people associated with an American mindset, I see it firsthand with so, so many people that I interact with in Germany, that if I had never been to Germany before, and I had never been to America before, and now I went to Germany and talked to those people, I would say, oh, that's a very German approach to life, because I see it so prevalent in society. Yeah, well, the, the Germans are actually really the, the world champions in traveling, I guess, or at least on the second, <laughs> on the second There place. You go. Yeah. yeah. But on the other hand, um, Uh, you know, we go through very severe struggles at the moment. So that's probably also part of the reason why your story is being kind of, you know, soaked in and really, you know, worked on and everything. Um, what did you experience when you were in Germany and you had your readings? You do, you're doing this, you have been doing this since a few years. Is there something special about that saying, not the German, but Austria, Switzerland, German speaking society or book reading society? Well, one of the wonderful things about those three countries is that there is a tremendous appreciation for books. And I would say that the amount of people who read books as a percentage of the overall population is very, very high. And also there are regulations in place to help make bookstores successful and make them accessible to people. And all of those things are just absolutely spectacular because we learn so much from reading. It gives us uh, a vision into other worlds. One of my great joys when I was a child was getting books and literally my entire summer was spent, you know, in bed reading book after book after book as a break from sort of academia. And so 
I love the fact that the unique infrastructure of those cultures is set up to enable people to have the opportunity to read and to encourage people to read. So I think it's a very, very special situation. Uh, and then it, there's also something wonderful about the connectivity of people. And so when I go to Germany, Switzerland or Austria, there's people outside at cafes talking and engaging and interacting with each other. And so one of the greatest things that I experience when I'm there and I say to someone, how did you find the book? And they say, oh, my best friend gave it to me or I gave it to my best friend and here she is standing next to me or I gave it to my mom or my mom gave it to me. And so I find that there is a tremendous amount of connectivity among people, maybe more than anywhere I've ever seen in the world. I think it's very, very special. Interesting. That never I never noticed this, I think, unless two or three months ago when I was sitting in a, at the Berlin cafe talking to an American guy and he said, well, look at this. You're sitting in the cafe and you never have this anywhere in the world. I said, no, that's not true. But at least not in the US because, okay, there's Italy, there's France. They, we have, they also have cafe cultures. You know, we're not the only ones. But what was right. interesting is I was in a very small place the last few weeks on the edge of the German la language area between Bavaria, Saxony and Czech um, Republic. And there I was running around with your book, the cafe um, on the edge of the world. And everybody said, oh, I know that book. Oh, I have read it. Oh, how do you find it? And I said, I'm on the edge of the world and everybody knows this book. How come? <laughs> of course, it's a bestseller. But just to, to give you that, that feedback, it was kind of impressing that everybody was, you know, kind of connecting to it, as you just said. So, and how cool that the culture existed where, yeah. you know, a stranger could see you holding that book and they were inspired to reach out and connect to you, even if it was just a, a couple of sentences like, oh, how are you enjoying that book? Or, oh, I've read that book. And I think that's very special and very unique uh, in, in the German speaking territories, to be honest with you. Yeah. And also everybody said that uh, it made really rise questions and really reflect on where am I in my life? Where do I want to go? Is that the right path? So, you know, you name it. Those are the questions. But I always uh, wonder, I, if you like, I would like to have a look on your childhood because I think there's the roots sure. for somebody who is so strong stepping out of his routine, which is you have to be a really strong personality or even just have a, this basic trust that you can, that you, can you know, follow, follow the new path with. Could you tell us a little bit about how your early childhood was? Yeah, so I grew up in a family of five. I have uh, two sisters, one older, one younger. So I was the middle child. Uh, my parents like used to tell the story that if it wasn't for me being the middle child, they're pretty sure my two sisters would have killed each other uh, <laughs> because I was the peacekeeper, which is often typical. You hear that a lot of a middle child. Um, but I was very athletic. I was a good student, but I didn't really enjoy school. I, I, I struggled with the concept of school in the same way that I struggled often with the human experience of asking myself, well, wait, what's the point? Like, <laughs> why are we here in this school setting? What am I supposed to get out of this? And I didn't quite understand that. And I think that's part of the reason that I struggled, why I had to spend so much time there. Uh, but as much as I am an adventurer now, as self-confident I am now in my understanding of my role in the human story, the purpose of my own life, I was not that as a kid at all. Um, I was, my parents decided to have me enter school as one of the youngest students. Okay. And so I was much smaller than most of my classmates. Uh, and so I think I struggled with that. And uh, yeah, I really struggled with my own self-confidence for a long, long time when I was growing up. So this might be, might be a, a brave maker also for people to see that even if you might have been self-conscious or insecure or whatever in, in your childhood, there is a way to become a bestseller author somehow. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, 100%. Uh, it's, you know, I think if we allow ourselves to, we all have the chance to do what I call hit our stride or find our lane. I believe everyone is here for a unique purpose and that they all have genius within them. And the trick is, can you allow that genius to come forth and blossom? And whether that is in the arts, whether it's in business, whether it's in being an amazing parent, everyone's going to determine what that is for them. But I do believe that is one of the great human opportunities and struggles is allowing ourselves to get clear on what you do that is unique or special and then letting that out into the world. And the crazy thing is that you can only know what's in your brain. 
So for example, I just assumed the entire time I was growing up that everyone was as creative as I was. Like I would invent stories in my mind, right? And I thought, well, that's what everybody's doing. They're inventing stories in their mind. Now, there's plenty of things that I don't do well, but what I've discovered is that inventing worlds, inventing stories is something I am particularly good at. And so that also, I think, is one of the unique opportunities is to figure out what are you really good at compared to everybody else. Uh, and it's not an easy thing, but you know what is a great tip for that is ask your best friends, hey, I know this may sound a little crazy, but what do you think I do well? Because so often our best friends recognize the genius within us, even if we don't recognize it in ourselves. So we're kind of like sometimes half blind on that eye looking on ourselves. Is that what yeah. you want to say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, exactly. you, you founded something or you wrote something in your books that you called the purpose of existence. That's how I translated the Z-D-E. That's how you, you, you know, make a shortcut of. So this is like the purpose of your existence. And the people or the, the main character in this book goes onto that path, developing or exploring what is his purpose of being there. And there's a few other characters asking about it. So in the third book, there's this girl, Jessica. She's, I think, 16 years old, and she has been always doing what her surrounding expected her. But she never really felt, what is really my, my longing? What, what, did I, what, does, what do I want from myself? So um, how, does she, how does she get out of this? Could you make a little um, insight into the third book out of the cafe on the edge of the world? Sure. So let me just clarify with you. So Jessica is actually in Cafe 2. That's Jessica is about 30 oh, years old. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Anna is in Cafe 3 and she's the 16 year old. So are yeah, you curious right. about the 16 perspective or the 30 perspective? No, the, the, the one who is um, always serving uh, what others expected her from to do. Yeah. Of, yeah. And, and she, for her, it's completely new. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Jessica at age 30 has lived a life where she was very actively running away from a life that was very traumatic. So she grew up in a very challenging ex environment as a child. And at a point where she was able to, she escaped that environment. And in a very profound discussion that she has with Casey, she realizes that she is spending so much time running away from who she was and didn't want to be that she hasn't allowed herself to run towards the person that she knows she could be. And I think that is a tremendous epiphany that so many of us come to in our lives. I certainly came to that in my own life as well of, you know, you, you have to be very careful that you're not trying to prove to people that you belong. And in truth, you're trying to belong to a club that you don't even want to be a part of. And it's about allowing ourselves to figure out who I really am the things that I love most in life, what I think the genius is that I want to share with the world, and then aligning our resources towards that as opposed to running away from this thing that we're not, or as opposed to trying to become a member of a group that we don't want to be a part of. Yeah, that was a, it's a huge epiphany in my life and it becomes a huge epiphany in the story for Jessica as well. And the concept of like, let's call it psychoanalysis analysis or having therapy, whatever, you know, it's, It's a big part in American life, also in German personalities' lives, to go to the therapist and talk about mm -hmm. the past. The concept that you're introducing us to is completely different. It's just focusing into the future or on the future and kind of gaining knowledge of what you or where you want to be. Um, did anybody come up to you from, like, let's call it the psychological bubble, saying, excuse me, John, Uh, it's a nice book and uh, of course it's great that you're a bestseller author now, but you missed out on that point. I talk about that point in different other writings actually. And it's something that I talk about a lot uh, when I do interviews uh, and in other things. If you, so I, if someone would say that to me, I would say, well, let's go back and take a look at the story. And in the stories, I do talk about it. And so in the case of Jessica, She had these different experiences that she had when she was growing up. And what we were just speaking of is a good example of that. And so these experiences that we have when we're younger basically become code that enters our unconscious perspective. And an example of that could be that uh, if I grew up in an environment where it's very hostile, maybe my parents are alcoholics, maybe my parents are just very angry and abusive, And so what I learn is to be an excessive pleaser because I'm trying always to keep things below the boiling point in the household. 
And then at some point you're out of that household, but your that behavior that you adopted as a survival mechanism is still part of who and what you are. And as adults, we then have the opportunity to look at our belief systems, to look at that old code that we wrote for ourselves as survival mechanisms and say, is that still who I need to be? Is that still who I want to be? And that's really what Casey and Jessica are discussing. So the difference I would say in the way that I bring these things to light is that I do it through stories and I do it through dialogue between the characters. Most people who are in the therapy world do it through nonfiction where they explain a concept in nonfiction format and then perhaps they give an example. Um, so we cover similar ground, we just do it in different ways. Okay, very diplomatic answer, but of course you're right. <laughs> I, I haven't uh, found obviously in the, the very right spots to, to get back to this. Um, but on the other hand, um, if you um, look on your past wanting to be a pilot, you always said it was another way to fly and you didn't know that your, your longing for w wanting to fly was fulfilled not by flying actually as a pilot, but flying in thought, in mind, in stories. Um, so do you think that uh, we always have those bridges in life where something tells us, yes, um, this is going to be my dream and then life fulfills it in another way? Or do you think we actually create that by ourselves? You understand the difference? Yeah, it's a really great question. And here's my guess. In, in the book that I wrote called Safari des Lebens, or Life Safari in English, the main character of Mama Gombe explains, she sort of challenges the character of Jack about the way that the human experience works. And there's two theories. Either A, your parents had sex and nine months later you were born, and now you're going to get 28,900 days statistically, and that will be that, right? And that's it. That's And, and if you look at life through that lens and you arrive at the conclusion, yeah, I actually think that's how life works, then what you end up coming up with as a solution is like, I might as well live an extraordinary life. Like this is it. I mean, there's no before, there's no after, this is it. And so I might as well be brave. I might as well be courageous. I might as well chart out my own path as much as possible and go live and do something special so that on my deathbed, I can look back and say, I, I did everything that I wanted to do. I'm happy with my life. The other theory is that you're actually something before you're born. You're a spirit, a soul, something. Then you, as Mama Gombe explains it in the book, you look at the life potential and you pick the type of challenges you would like to experience. And maybe you say, I want to grow up in a challenging household. Maybe I, I want to have a lack of self-confidence when I'm younger. I want to, and you pick a, sort of off the big board of life, the things that you think would be interesting growth opportunities. And then you enter the human form, but you can't remember what you picked. However, this is direct response to your question. Along the way, we get little reminders, and those are bigger than us making choices. Those are part of the algorithm of the universe, part of the algorithm of life, which sort of gently taps you on the shoulder at the start and says, hey, here's an opportunity to address that challenge that you picked for yourself. Now, what I've discovered in my own life by looking in the rearview mirror and noticing patterns of life experiences I've had and patterns of my own behavior is that these reminders start off with a very gentle little tap on the shoulder, and then it becomes a little more significant tap. And eventually, if I don't pay attention, it becomes like a giant two by four across the forehead that says, pay attention, right? And so I believe it's a collaborative effort uh, between us and our destiny. And I do believe from my own perspective, I'm not saying this is the answer because I will only know that after I've died and really have a perspective on this whole thing. But I do believe that we are something before we're born and I believe we're something after. And so the question is, what are we going to do while we're here in the human form? And I believe it is to grow. I believe it is to contribute. I believe it is to have fun along the way. And that as we're going through that, we are not alone, that there is a system in place to help us with that. So you rec recommend as a tool the big five, um, let's, yeah, the big five as a safari. And the big five are those big five animals of the African continent, which is, please correct me, the, li the lion, the leopard, the rhino, the elephant, and the... Yep, the last one is the African buffalo. The African buffalo, exactly. Thank you very much. So um, you pick those five big animals, which are, of course, very impressive, but they are also known from uh, the major hunt. So is that something that we can derive from to your stories or to your understanding is life a big hunt or is it just you know 
practical as a symbol for five hints that you want to give us? And what Historically, the African Big Five was something that people talked about from a big game perspective. And over the last 40 years or so, what it's evolved to is it's the African Big Five from a photo perspective, from an experiential perspective. Okay. And so when I share the Big Five for life. I say it's the five things that you most want to do, see, or experience in your life while you're here in the human form. Uh, so yeah, it's not about hunting them down. It's about doing, seeing, and experiencing them. And that could be one of the most collaborative, calm, relaxing experiences of your life, depending on what's on your big five for life. It could be something more adventurous. If you said, I wanted to whitewater raft all the class five rapids that exist in the countries that border my own country, uh, there would be a little bit of a, like, let's go out and do this type of thing, right? That's not quite the calm thing. Um, but that's the essence of it, the things that you want to do, see, and experience. Okay, so um, we hope, of course, that um, everybody kind of gets to his or her big fives. But what if somebody comes up to you and says, well, listen, John, I've read it all, and you're doing a great job, but you know what? It sounds so simple, but my life is so complicated. Yeah. Do you have an answer for a person like this? So over the years since I first wrote The Big Five for Life, and I introduced that concept first in Safari Dislevens, uh, that concept of The Big Five for Life through the dialogues between Mama Gombe and Jack. And then I introduced it in a different way in The Big Five for Life book, which is in the context of leadership and that we are all leaders, if the even if the only person that we're leading is ourselves. And so when you have those two perspectives, one is more adventure out there traveling based and the other one is more of the everyday. I'm working in an environment. I'm, I'm going through a life that is more traditional by most people's definition of traditional. What you discover is that no matter what is on your big five for life list, and I say this from having helped thousands and thousands of people over the years who asked for help discovering their big five for life, that no matter what is on their life list, there's always something that they can do even with no money to help bring that into their existence, even if it's just for a couple of minutes a day. And so, yeah, I would say no matter what someone says on the, is on their big five for life list and no matter where they're at in life, I've never come across a situation where I couldn't help them figure out some ways to start bringing that into their existence. And the crazy cool thing is that the more you start to bring it into your existence, the more people you meet who can help make that more of a permanent place in your existence. You know, so maybe at the beginning, if your drive, if your dream is to sail and you live in the middle of Germany where there are no lakes and no boats and no whatever. So at the beginning, you're just looking at magazines and you're looking at YouTube videos and the rest of that. But the more you start to connect with people who do sail, at some point, someone's going to be like, what? Come out to Hamburg, right? Or come out to the North Sea and <laughs> go sail with me. And that's just a natural progression, no matter what is on your big five for life list, that it's going to become more and more. Uh, pronounced and give you more and more opportunities. So that's it's like a really beautiful thing. I have to say, it's it's one of the most special experiences to watch someone go from very very confused about life to just so enthused about waking up every single day because they realize how close they are to living the life that they want. So this is like a positive, um, self fulfilling prophecy kind of thing. Yeah, well, it's it's sort of a an obvious big numbers thing, right? And so if you don't know what you want to do with your life, what are the odds that anybody who's around you can help you with that? But if you said, oh, I'd really love to try kayaking sometime, and you start telling everybody who's in your circle, your friends, your family, the people you work with, odds are that somebody is either going to have been kayaking and can give you some guidance about that, or maybe they are an active kayaker, or this is the part that I love the most. When you share something like that, What you're doing is you're tapping into everyone that person has ever met in the past, everyone they know now, and everyone they will meet in the future. I can't tell you the amount of people who know what's on my big five for life list, one of which is to write a song that breaks the top 10 of the pop charts, who will reach out to me years later after they hear about it and say, oh, I just met this amazing person you should talk to, or oh, I just heard this amazing song. This totally reminds me of the stuff that you write, and you could do this. And so it's it's really a very logical perspective when you think about it that you're sharing the dream and when someone comes across something that can help make that dream come come true they're going to tell somebody about it they're going to tell you about it so we've heard it john you want to make that song <laughs> we're going to be the ones to remind you and within a few years maybe next year maybe next month who nobody knows except you right I love it. That's great. Okay. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Well, I got you there. I'm going to get back to that. <laughs>
Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, well, thank you so much for uh, for meeting up with us here at Cosmic Cine TV. And thank you for sharing all your experiences, your thoughts, and of course, the knowledge of your books. I just want to hold them into our picture because I have at least three of them here. Just to remind yeah. you and to see that the background of John being on the picture with his background having the same motif than on those books. So, yeah, it was great to talk to you, John. Good luck for everything. And now I'm going to listen to the music every time I, um, I read and hear your name, right? Vielen Dank an John P. Strelecki. Ich habe viel gelernt. Ich bin vor allem ganz neugierig auf das nächste Buch, was da rauskommen wird und natürlich auch wie weit es um die Welt gehen wird. John, do you have any kind of special message to the German audience that you want to give us? Uh, well, first of all, I would just love to say thank you. Uh, it's just been such an amazing experience interacting with the fans. Last year we were on tour. We had a, a bus for the fourth book in the cafe series that we rode around the country and had the opportunity to meet individually with fans at the different events. And it was just so special. The people are absolutely amazing. Their passion for making a difference in the lives of others, their enthusiasm for living an extraordinary life is very, very inspiring. And so I would just say thanks. Vielen Dank in meiner deutschen Lesen. Super. Dankeschön auch an dich und viele Grüße nach Florida. Um, ich freue mich schon, wenn wir das nächste Buch hier in der Hand haben. Danke, John. Bis zum nächsten Mal.